Tower welcomes you to today's webinar uh, entitled, What to Know, Considerations for Wireless Broadband Network Deployments. Uh, my name is Jeff Deal. I'm a senior manager in our vertical, vertical markets department. Um, I've been with American Tower for 17 years, uh, focused on our vertical markets, which uh, specifically to me is fiber, cable, and backhaul customers. Um, and uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion as well as sharing some of the insight uh, in regards to wireless network deployments. Uh, before we start our discussion, I have a few notes uh, to ask questions at any time during the webinar. Simply click the Q&A icon centered at the bottom of your screen and type your question in the box. We want this to be interactive, so please submit questions as we go through our, this session. Um, we'll do our best to answer your questions as, as time allows at the conclusion of today's discussion. Um, also, a recording of today's webinar will, will be made available to you. Um, so please welcome, uh, please welcome my fellow panelists, Alan Frazier, Senior Director with Nexia Solutions, Michael Chase, Vice President of Sales Operations with Tesco Technologies, and my colleague here at America Tower, Steve Cockman, who's the Director of Deployment Services. Um, a little bio on, on our attendees here is for 18 years, Alan has been working in the telecommunications industry serving primarily in construction-related roles with increasing responsibilities and range. Uh, today, he oversees a workforce who manages and performs the complete construction process, uh, including site development, site acquisition, permitting, construction, and integration for wireless networks. Um, the next one is Michael, has nearly 15 years of senior executive experience in the wireless distribution space. Uh, in his current role, he delivers thought leadership in the value-added wireless provider market. With a, with a passion for streamlining processes and products, he is particularly focused on improving the customer experience for companies desiring to start, grow, and thrive in the wireless space. Uh, lastly uh, is Steve. With more than 17 years of telecommunications experience, Steve has worked closely with companies to help develop and deploy their wireless networks. Uh, he's been with American Tower since 2001 and currently as a Director of Deployment Services. He and his team provide key support to customers throughout the network deployment process. Um, again, welcome to all of you. Now let's get started. Uh, our first question is to the panel, what are some of the resources available when planning network deployments and uh, network development and deployments? I'll start with Alan. Thanks for the opportunity, Jeff, and uh, good to be here today. So. Um, so a whole host of uh, things that go into network, wireless network systems services. And so uh, our planning is one, site acquisition, um, compliance, zoning and permitting, and then construction services actually installing those on the, uh, on the towers and the locations. Um, I go to Google quite a bit. Google machine works pretty well for us um, when I'm looking for something that I, that I don't have a beat on or a resource for. Um, there's also professional social network. Um, there's a lot of networking that goes on within, say, for example, LinkedIn is a good spot to go. And then within those social networks, there's also subgroups uh, for RF engineering, construction management, site acquisition services. And so those are some of the resources that, that um, I would go, go for to, to get the answers. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Sure. Um, so from a resource perspective, um, you know, Tesco employs or has access to uh, solution architects, sales engineers, uh, technical support representatives. Um, we've got program managers who help, you know, in the, in the uh, management uh, of uh, these, you know, site deployments, uh, supply chain experts, you know, as it relates to uh, how we acquire and how long it takes from a lead time perspective, uh, acquire equipment, as well as uh, program management experts and expertise. Uh, leveraging, you know, all the manufacturers and vendors um, and, and their knowledge or deep knowledge of, of product sets. Great. Um, and just to add, uh, over the last four years, I've been working on the, uh, like, emerging accounts. And I think that some of the things that we get asked regularly is on the front end of the planning. And I think you'll hear that uh, throughout our conversation today, which is the planning. How do you get engaged? Um, and one of the essential parts of the planning the network is, what are the available spaces on the tower, right? Where are you going to be in regards to the height? Is there fiber available there? Is there utilities available there? Is there a shelter that you can go inside of there? And that's, uh, the point is, is that you wanna be engaged with tower codes as, as, as soon as possible. 
to understand those scenarios because any of those issues that could arise, whether it's fiber accessibility, utility accessibility, could be the long poles in the tent. So you want to get those questions answered on the front end. You don't want to just take a site because it looks like there's availability because there could be a lot of variables on the back end that could impact that. Um, and some things that we're doing and some of our partners are doing is, is RF planning um, from a high level perspective of, hey, what does it look like if we want to design a specific city? What would it look like from a coverage objective? You know, will we have contiguous coverage? Is it going to be islands? So those are the types of things America Tower and some of the other tower codes can offer you as well as some of our partners. Um, but the consistent measures is going to be planning. Um, the next question we'll jump into is, what should new entrants consider when looking to deploy a wireless network? And we'll start with Steve. Great, thank you, Jeff. So there are there are a number of different factors that uh, the new entrant should be uh, considering when trying to deploy a new a, a new wireless network. Uh, I think you mentioned just to start off with uh, the design uh, portion of uh, of the of the project. You've got site acquisition. You've got equipment. You've got uh, utilities, which includes power and backhaul, uh, and you have construction. So each of these different uh, sections uh, all have multi uh, or, or multiple issues that you have to deal with with each one. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of factors that go into it. Um, you know, from a from a tower company perspective, uh, I'll touch on the site acquisition just for a second because I know you guys will, will talk about the, uh, the construction. But from a site acquisition. For most of your large tower companies, you're looking at uh, understanding the, the antenna requirements or the equipment requirements. You're going to have to complete an application. You're going to have to run a structural analysis. You're going to need a set of construction drawings, and you're probably going to need a, a building permit depending on where you are. So each of those, no matter really who you're, you're using for, for uh, your uh, network, you're probably going to need some sort of each of those. So, okay. Great. Michael, would you like to add? Sure. Yeah, and, and I think to add on to Steve's point, I think there's, once you understand a lot of those variables, there's the aspect of understanding what equipment uh, you might need to, to solve the problems you're you know, looking to, to, to solve in the, um, in the deployment. So understanding you know, what your options are, um, who uh, are, are the best you know, makers of that equipment, uh, what frequencies and so on. It, it's really from our perspective, I think all about uh, the planning uh, you know, from and, and seeking advice from trusted advisors, folks who are really trained in understanding, uh, especially from the uh, product side of the house, understanding what all the variables are uh, in the equation and, and really um, using that to guide you know, your, your project. Great, thanks for that. Um, and we'll move right into the next question, which is what is a typical timeline for deploying a fixed wireless network? And what could impact the timeline? We'll start with Alan. So that question, uh, there's a lot of variables that go into that. So you know, from, from a standpoint uh, of where we are as a company, the installation piece is, is typically pretty easy. That's, that's, that's the easy part, putting it on the structure. Um, getting to that point with uh, site acquisition, as Steve brought up, um, the zoning, the permitting, uh, the compliance, the regulatory compliance, FAA, making sure that your intentions uh, meet those requirements. And, uh, digging in the dirt, there could be environmental hazards there. You have to make sure that you have done your due diligence. Um, and in doing those three things, you want to do them all at the same time. If, if you take one at a time, um, it could really draw out the, the timelines. Um, so you have to be able to, to multitask. Um, again, find good resources. There's good companies out there now that, that do the, the whole whole thing turnkey. Um, you know, our, our company, for one, not to plug us, but we, we can do site acquisition, zoning, permitting, construction installations, and so forth. So there's companies like ours that are out there, and then there's smaller companies that specialize just in the site acquisition piece or just the RF planning piece. Um, and so I guess I'd, I'd skirt it around the question. Uh, I think the timelines, they, they take, they, they could take a six months to a year to do a small network. It could take years to do a larger network. Um, but I, from my vantage point and, and my experience, the, the construction piece is usually the fastest piece. It's that front end planning work that takes the most time. All right, so we now know that you've got the easiest job at the table. That's right, that's great. Right. <laughs> that's exactly. Uh, <laughs> Michael, would you like to add your comments as well? Sure, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a, you know, a typical timeline. You know, I would 100% agree. And, and I would say at the end of the day, I mean, look, these things can take you know, months uh, and, and certainly years uh, 
and from our perspective, we've got a lot of, of just-in-time manufacturers, right, that, are, that aren't that um, are necessarily building all this equipment in advance, right, uh, and ready on a shelf like in uh, Best Buy or something. So, so there's an aspect of, of us really, um, uh, I think, understanding is in their planning phases what exactly uh, is, is needed and, and working with, you know, uh, the customer and working with the contractors and working with uh, folks who are doing permits and, and site visits, you know, to, uh, to really dial in uh, what's needed and, and, and kind of where. Um, so, but I wouldn't say there is a typical timeline for any, every single deployment is, I think, going to be unique. Uh, and, and therefore, um, it's really based on what you're trying to, what problems you're trying to solve. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve, would you like to add your insights on timelines? Yeah. I mean, to, to kind of further what these guys are saying, there's lots of variables that go into the timelines for, for building a, a wireless network. Uh, one of the things that, that, you know, I would recommend is, is look at your tower companies, right? Just so your, your tower companies are already trying to reduce some of those issues that, that pop up. And so if you can, if you can work with somebody who already has the, you know, the power telco already there, or, you know, you don't have to go through compliance. Maybe you can cut some of those issues that maybe take some longer times. Um, but from a, from a tower company perspective, I mean, there's typically a few things that, uh, that you can do to, to increase, right? I mean, what we're looking for is, you know, making sure your, your lease is signed, right? Making sure that you have your drawings and you can approve your, your construction drawings that, that it says what you want it to, that you pick up your permit, right? And then any outstanding fees that are paid, you know, if you, if you do those four or five things, typically what you'll find is that working through a tower company, that site acquisition piece will actually go pretty quickly and you can move into some of the other, uh, uh, some of the other parts that we talked about earlier. Great. Thank you for that feedback. And I think that's going to be the key that we we're talking about. I mean, now we're into the, the, the idea of like timelines and the earlier that you engage, uh, whether it's the tower codes or the construction and, and, and uh, folks that can provide the, uh, the, the equipment as well, the earlier you engage with that, the better. I think from our perspective, we, we talk about identifying towers with the path of least resistance uh, for some of our emerging markets deployments. And that might be a site that is structurally sound today um, it has access to fiber has access to utilities and identifying those on the front end so that as people are trying to build their networks they can identify those and as they're starting to grow then those maybe the, the second tier sites that might have an issue and that way it's a project flow so it's just a better understanding and that's us interacting with our partners as well to find that information um, so we'll jump into the next question was um, we're working with a tower company how are we how, how do we approve general contractors and identify them and how are they secured? And we'll start that with Alan. So uh, Nexius does a lot of work for the tower companies. Um, and, and I think the big reason is for that last question was because those sites are plug and play. They're, they're already in place. Um, so the, the carriers will go to those, those companies first to try to, to do the, get their coverage objectives met. It's just easier for everyone already. Um, when I go to American Tower to work on their sites, in order to do that, American Tower has a, has a list of guidelines that I need to meet. Um, we, we sign an MSA agreement um, to say that yes, these, our crews will meet these requirements. And most of that is based on, uh, well, not most of it, but a lot of it's based on safety to make sure that our crews are certified and, and trained correctly um, so that no one gets hurt and no one goes unsafe. Um, there's also insurance requirements that have to be met. Um, they, they look at EMR records and, and OSHA logs. Um, and so that's all very important stuff. So that's, so we have to mandate that with whether we're using our self appointed crews to do that work or if we're using subcontractors to, to bring in. So we have to make sure that our subcontractors can meet those requirements as well. Um, and so that's what we're typically used to seeing. But we, I particularly like it because uh, with that, when I go to work on a tower company site, I have a tower company rep in conjunction with the carrier rep. So now I have two guys to make sure that I'm doing the correct thing that they want to do, um, following their set guidelines and rules. There's a check-in, check-out process. It's just more structured and more organized. Um, so that's some of the, the, the challenges that we go through. And it's not really a challenge. It's actually more of a blessing compared to some of the other type of installations. That we yeah, standardizing the process. That's correct. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, Steve, would you like to add your comments? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with everything that Alan said, right? Um, at American Tower, our number one priority is safety, right? So we are we are looking to ensure 
that the crews that work on our towers, both for us and for our customers, uh, have an impeccable safety rating, right? It's something that, that we take very seriously. Uh, we actually have a, a supply chain and procurement, procurement organization that is constantly reviewing uh, these records that, uh, that Alan, is, that's, he's uh, talking about and uh, ensuring that the contractors that we have on site do meet the standards that we, re we require. Um, you know, we, we make sure that, as he said, they're, they're insured and qualified. So uh, it is something we take very seriously. We look for, for contractors that both have a national and a, a regional, um, you know, reach. So, you know, we, we do look to make sure that people are qualified to do what we're asking them to do on the tower. And, and thank you for that. And I think this is a, another question for a lot of the emerging accounts uh, that ask us, can we self-perform? Right? That's one of the questions they ask that, hey, we've climbed towers before. Uh, and the answer to that is always, they have to be an approved American Tower vendor. You have to be approved through our process. So if you're not approved, we can talk about that opportunity of being approved. Um, but we also have a, li a list of our, our vendors that we can utilize that you can select from um, that can assist you with that deployment. So. Uh, both scenarios, we can help you through that process, but make sure we are engaged early in that discussion as well. Um, and the next question, um, what type of typical coverage distance uh, from a fixed wireless antenna and how much bandwidth can each antenna accommodate? Um, and I'll jump into this one first. Uh, it's been really fun to watch. This has been an exciting time for myself who I've been operating in the, in the ISP space for the last couple of years and recently moved over into fiber and cable. But um, the availability of equipment and the performance that it has today, just compared to a couple of years ago, is it's exponentially better, right? The, the bandwidth capabilities the, uh, to deliver more service to your customers has been an exciting thing to watch because it was just a few years ago that there were a lot of ISPs out there and broadband service providers that were basically at capacity. They couldn't add any additional equipment. They couldn't sell under that tower anymore. They couldn't generate any additional revenue because they're limited by the equipment. I think what we're seeing now with LTE and, and MIMO is that customers can now add this newer equipment, expands their capacity, generates more revenue, um, and it's a win-win for both sides. So I think this has been an exciting thing for us. Um, as a company, uh, we provide data. We understand that business of how broadband providers uh, deploy their networks and the type of revenue they typically generate. So we try to help them and build a business case by understanding the, uh, the household counts within three miles. So we can kind of get it, we can get a view and, and share with our, our potential customers what we believe the revenue could be under that site, right? We understand what their penetration rate is from the subscribers in the area, what we think their average revenue would be per sub, and we can kind of build a business case around that site to, just to make sure that they're making a good a, a good decision on that tower because we don't want it to come back and within a year or two and it just didn't make sense. So we are providing that data to our customers just so that they understand what they're getting into as well. Um, we typically use three to four miles. Obviously, um, the terrain, the power, and so forth, there's a lot of variables in there. So it can always change, but there's new technologies and new opportunities out there. But that's typically what we do is three to four miles um, but there are some variables in there, but we'd love to help you with that. Um, and Michael, would you like to expand a little bit on that? Sure, I completely agree. Um, I would add, I mean, so we manage, you know, 400 uh, vendors or manufacturers, uh, and we have literally thousands of, of SKUs, right, focused on, um, you know, on, on this. And, and at the end of the day, uh, we've also, you know, there's there's crazy advancements in technology and capabilities, right? So there's, a, there's an evolution of the technology even over time. So from our perspective, I don't think there is an average either. Uh, and it really depends on, on the technology you're looking at. Uh, and also there's, you know, old technology that's going end of life and, and new technology that's replacing it. So we've got, you know, uh, dozens of staff members who are focused entirely on understanding the ins and outs of every antenna uh, that's out there and, and how they can be used in, in different scenarios. Um, and, and, you know, to basically meet the challenges. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and once again, we we want this to be interactive. So please click on the Q and A box and submit questions. Uh, we'd love to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, I'll jump into the next question, which is, what is the customer's general what customer's general contractor responsible for when installing network equipment? And we'll start with Alan. 
So it varies with us. Um, one customer may want us to supply all the antennas, the coax, the fiber, um, everything that's in conjunction with the installation except for proprietary uh, equipment. Um, other customers say that they want to provide more um, so that they can have a cost savings. Um, but that's also a management a logistics issue for them as well. So it varies with each customer. Uh, we're prepared uh, to do it either way. Uh, we have warehouse space that we can, we can purchase uh, antennas, coax, uh, fiber, and PC power. Um, and then we're also required to hold the licenses uh, so that we can pull electrical permits um, and that we can get our electrical services for the customer and so forth. Um, and then our general contractor's license, of course, uh, because there's always a building permit attached to it that you have to get final inspections to make sure that you're clear and you're done with the installation. Okay, um, and Steve, would you like to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, from a from a tower company perspective, you know, I'm, I mentioned a few things uh, in one of the earlier questions, right? Design, site acquisition, equipment, power telco, and uh, and construction. Um, typically, what we look for uh, from from the customers is that the the last three are, are something that uh, typically we need support from the uh, from the customers, right? So from an equipment standpoint, we need them to provide the equipment, right? The lines, the antennas, the transmitters. Um, and then power and telco, if it's not there. So I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the benefits of using a, a large tower company is we try to eliminate certain things that potentially may take a long time. So we try to bring tower, uh, power and telco to our site. So it's a, a plug and play situation, right? It takes one of those variables away from, from the timelines. Uh, but if it's not there, you know, we can assist on that, but typically we'll have to get the customer's uh, involvement to help us get that, get the account set up because it will technically be their, their power and their, their back home. Um, and then construction, as, as Alan mentioned, um, you know, we, we do offer um, some construction management um, uh, services. Uh, that we could that we could use to support, but you know, at the end of the day, we'll end up, you know, using somebody like like uh, Alan here and, and somebody who's qualified to to help us in that. Yeah, and I think that's the important piece because we're we're likely interacting with folks that are getting ready to deploy a wireless network as well as folks that have been deploying it for for years potentially, and that the scope is important because that scope consistently changes uh, on a smaller scale. Traditionally, some folks may do their services work in-house, right? but once they reach that breaking point of expanding to a certain threshold, they need to engage uh, a third party to do that services work. So I think while we're talking about that scope, it's, it's ever-changing. Um, so when those expansions are, are happening and you need assistance, that's when I think you're really seeing the benefits of hiring a third party to assist with that because once you get to a certain point, uh, you really need uh, dedicated services to start pulling permits, uh, going eventually through zoning hearings and so forth. So that's going to be an essential piece to uh, understanding your timelines again. Um, we'll jump into the next question, which is over the last few years, uh, what have been some of the most significant changes in the fixed wireless industry? What changes do you see happening in the next one to three years? Uh, and I'll start off on this one. It's back to my earlier comment where it's been exciting to see the evolution of the equipment. I think with LTE uh, and MIMO happening over the last couple of years um, and the evolution of or the, 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 the accessibility into funding has been an exciting thing to see because many of our emerging customers have had limitations on their builds because they haven't had access to funding. Um, and I think that funding also allows us to, uh, to have them in, or interact with this third party services companies as well to actually help them build their business, which has been great. Uh, over the next couple of years, I would think that the two big things that I see are, one, the availability of spectrum. I think we've touched on it over the last day or so in our conversations about CBRS. Um, the availability at a low cost to get involved or in frequency that is uh, licensed is, could be 150 megahertz of spectrum, right, in some areas that other folks aren't participating in. So for someone to have 150 megahertz of licensed spectrum in their market to deploy is, is exciting, you know, when they've been deploying unlicensed and some of that has gotten uh, a little bit uh, uh, congested in certain markets. And then the last part is, is for us, from working previously in the uh, in the broadband space, is the availability of grants, right? So you got CAF, um, 
you've got rust funding, you have a lot of other availability to deliver broadband into the rural markets. So those are the really exciting things that I've been a part of over the last couple of years. And maybe Michael, you could speak a little bit more. Yeah, I'd certainly like to echo the, the spectrum availability. I think with uh, CBRS and 5G LTE, right? Uh, technology and capabilities. I mean, that certainly has, I think, started to really change uh, the landscape and accelerate what we've seen, you know, kind of happen in our environment. Um, in addition, I would say, you know, because of that equipment advancements, right? You got to keep up, uh, you know, with all these these uh, new spe spectrum capabilities. And with the downturn of 2G and 3G, right? Um, you know, that's really what's helping to drive, I think, some of those technology advancements. And, and I would say, as we look forward, the, the additional use cases. So we talk about, you know, IoT. I came from an IoT background myself, uh, and, and, uh, and really things like autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. I mean, there's there's so many different use cases where, um, you know, we're going to need newer technologies, uh, newer capabilities as it relates to edge computing and other things. Uh, that's where I really see, I think, the, the future going uh, from a technology standpoint. Yeah, great, great feedback. Uh, uh, Alan, would you like to add your comments as well? Yeah, so, I, you know, the last uh, five years that, like you had brought up, LTE was, was big. Um, pulling that radio out of the cabinet on the ground and putting it closer to the, putting a hardened shell and putting it closer to the, uh, the antenna with remote radio heads, they're everywhere now. Um, the, the fiber backhaul, that, that transformation between T1s and DS3s to, to fiber, uh, that really increases your speeds and your capability. Um, so that's what we've kind of endured. We've been working primarily, I would say that the bulk of our work, installation work, has been adding, uh, techno adding technologies or enhancing the existing technologies on sites. Um, there's a good backbone of tower companies that have existing structures there. We're just enhancing the, the different carriers, uh, current system, existing systems. And then going forward, uh, 5G is the big buzzword. Um, that's where we're headed next. From an installation standpoint, um, Mike brings up a good point with uh, smart city, smart cars. Um, that deployment's coming out, and uh, we hope to be a big player in that too from an installation standpoint. Um, pretty excited about that whole thing. It's something new. Yeah, no, that's both. And then to uh, expand a little bit on both of your comments, is that uh, you're starting to see the fiber companies kind of migrate more into the wireless deployments to partner a little bit more with those folks to, with the understanding that uh, with these the new equipment and the capability of the equipment, you, you need fiber, right? That That's an essential piece. So we're starting to see that come together and then working together and actually us getting involved in that piece as well to make sure that they have that. So that's, that's um, uh, been an exciting piece as well. So um, I'll jump into the last question, which is uh, what's the final piece of advice that you'd give to companies looking to start or expand their fixed wireless networks? And we'll start with Alan. Well, planning, and, and I, I think that we we all agree that that planning, planning, planning is, is key to this. Um, uh, and, and to be able to, uh, well, in today's world, in the telecoms world, it's it's a lot more convenient because there's a lot more resources than when, when we kind of started our careers in telecoms. Um, it was kind of renegade cowboy days, and um, these days there's a lot of, uh, Good companies with good reputations, good histories that that have fine tuned this and made it a whole lot easier. The tower companies in general, um, like I said earlier, it's 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 so much more easier for us to go and do work on their their sites because it's plug and play in a lot of cases. Um, good management, good structure, um, and so I, I would if, if I was starting my own wireless network. That's where I would start. I would I would start with going to people who already have been through the pain and the struggles and, and how it can lead you in the right direction. Yep. Well, that's great feedback. Michael? Sure. Uh, I suppose I probably would evoke a Donald Rumsfeld quote uh, regarding there are known knowns, things you know you know, known unknowns, things you know you don't know, and unknown unknowns. And I think the unknown unknowns are the most dangerous, right? For everybody, for all of us, regardless of the situation. So uh, I think, you know, folks like American Tower, folks like Tesco, folks like Nexus really help, I think, isolate and identify those unknown unknowns, right? Eliminate those or at least make them known unknowns so that we can focus on what are the problems that we have to solve and um, and how best do we solve those problems. So there's there's tremendous number of, of resources, I think we touched on the first question, available to help isolate and identify, you know, all the, all the, uh, the known or the unknown unknowns. 
uh, and, and make a deployment go uh, the way you want it to. And, and even as things change, scope changes to your previous point all the time. We have, uh, you know, site bills go out, site bills come in from a date perspective. And, and um, the more things and uh, variables you can isolate, the more uh, risk you can limit. Yeah. Absolutely, Steve. Um, you know, don't want to sound like a broken record, but, uh, you know, engage early in the process, right? Uh, contact somebody that knows what they're doing, right? Um, I would say, uh, for me, where I would start is, is the large tower companies, right? Hopefully American Tower, uh, because we do have those resources that we've developed over the, you know, the last few decades. Uh, you know, we've got folks like Jeff that, that understand, you know, what we're trying to do, and what we have on our assets and, and being able to really, you know, eliminate some of the questions that, that pop up early in the process. So, you know, go with people who, who have done it and, and start early. Yeah. That was great feedback. Um, and I'll share a story because I think, Alan, you went down the road of us folks that have been in the industry for a while and uh, reflecting back to those days of, uh, if you knew where you wanted to have coverage, it, you would jump in the car with three other guys and you'd go drive in that area and try and identify a tower and then try and get to it and see what's available. Is there power? Is there telco? What is there? Um, and now a lot of those, uh, uh, the capabilities to identify all that on the front end are available to you online, right? So the tower companies are giving you those capabilities, you know, some of the RF designing tools and that's, uh, and I didn't touch on it on, you know, some of the, the things that are coming out, but the software and the platforms that are available to these emerging customers are fantastic. Um, so once again, engage early, see what kind of opportunities and partners are out there for you, even from the tower side, it's just simply identifying what's available, right? So you're not driving into those rural markets and we're just doing some, uh, personally doing some scrubs uh, an hour ago about, you know, hey, what's, what's here? And within minutes, I could tell them exactly what was happening at that site. And that would <laughs> that would have taken five to seven hours and staying in a hotel in the middle of nowhere, you know, years ago. So I think that's key is engage and understand the tools that are out there for you guys to use. Um, and with that, um, with the remaining uh, time today, uh, we're going to go ahead and answer some of the questions. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please click the Q&A icon. Send uh, set it on the bottom of your screen and type your question in the box. Um, so with that, we'll jump right into some of these questions, um, which is the first one is, what are some of the ways to learn about the industry? Um, and uh, I guess I'll kind of open that up to the panel. It's not specific to anyone. So if you want to jump in, feel free to answer the question. If not, I'll jump in myself. So a good resource for, for me is, uh, <clears throat> so I have a LinkedIn page. Um, I'm tuned in to uh, groups that are that are surrounded with telecommunications in the industry itself. Um, wireless Estimator is a good resource um, to get the, the most current up to date. They sometimes have articles of, of history and where we've come. Um, Twitter. Uh, last Sunday, I was I was sent a couple of tweet Twitter links that uh, explained where we we're going with 5G and where we started with 1G. Yeah. Um, and the cell phone technology. Um, so there's a lot of good resources there. Again, the Google machine, I love it. It works well for me. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's where I would go. Okay. Anything else? Sure. I mean, I think, so there's a tremendous number of trade shows that are constantly yes. going on all over the country. I mean, there's events uh, happening every week, you know, in, in a different city, you know. And, and so I would say, if you are interested in getting into the space, you know, look for trade shows in your area, right? That might be going on. Uh, go and talk to vendors. You know, and it's a great opportunity to really kick the tires and understand kind of what's out there. Uh, have conversations with other folks like yourselves who might be interested in uh, getting into this space, right? Uh, and use that as a great jumping-off point. In addition to all the stuff you can obviously gain access to online. Great. Uh, I, I would say, in addition to trade shows, uh, most areas and states have wireless associations as well uh, that have events pretty regularly, uh, you know, most of them are quarterly or, or twice a year or something like that. But uh, most states do have a wireless association. So you could go to one of the events, sign up and, and really uh, get to know some some different folks. Yeah, that's great feedback. Um, and uh, one of the questions that it appears a little more tower related is, uh, there are several American tower sites uh, in the area that are abandoned. Is there a possibility that these sites can be acquired from American tower? 
Um, typically, we're not in the uh, the sales position right now. <laughs> Buying um, question right there. We, uh, yeah, um, and that's just because the the industry is evolving, right? That uh, today, where people are deploying networks, might not have been where they were looking years ago. So I think from American Network perspective, we're always looking at new opportunities to expand our reach and to assist folks in their wireless deployment. So um, uh, if you're interested in those assets, please reach out to us directly and we can help you with uh, uh, getting on those towers. Um, next one is, uh, can you explain or please explain to the best of your knowledge the potential impact of 3.5 3 gigahertz spectrum auction and how network operations should plan for this? I'm going to open it up to the panel, so I'm just, uh, referring to CBRS. Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I'm probably the best student to answer this. I'm probably the least technical on the panel uh, from that perspective. But, you know, I think based on what I've come to understand uh, and I, what I think I know, I mean, I, I certainly think there's going to be an opportunity now for um, for different you know, owners, uh, you know, and whether it be stadium owners or building owners, or there's going to be a lot of new folks who are going to have access to a uh, spectrum that they've never had before. Uh, and so, you know, I think it, it largely is going to be determined by someone's appetite uh, to, to really supply that type of service and what kind of problems they'd like to solve. But I think it opens up uh, so many new doors uh, and, and opportunities. Uh, for building owners that have never been available, they've only been available to the carriers, you know, in the past. So. Yeah. yeah, and I, uh, to dovetail on that, it's there are still a lot of variables in this, right? We don't know the uh, the, the areas uh, that will be available and the size of those areas, and you know when the auction will take place. But I, I think the most exciting part for me, and and listening to some of the conversations that are going on, is the availability for new entrants into the space to come in, right? Folks that. Uh, Owning spectrum has always been the uh, the largest hurdle to jumping into this space, right? So you, your only availability to that was unlicensed, um, and now if you have the ability to have licensed spectrum um, and the and the capacity that we're talking about is possibly up to 150 megahertz, like you're going to see a lot of new entrants that want to play in the wireless space. And they've just been hesitant to do so in the past. So from our perspective, it, it's an exciting time because I think it's going to be small cells, it's going to be macro sites, it's going to be in-building coverage, it's, it's going to be all of it. And I think the winner is the end user, right? Their experience is going to get better and better and their capacity and their network is going to get better and better. Um, so uh, as you walk around now and no one actually makes a phone call anymore, everybody has FaceTime, right? So, I mean, the capacity of the networks need to grow and, and that availability of spectrum is going to be fantastic. Um, the next question, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on myself, which is, Proxy, how much does it cost to build a WISP infrastructure using American Tower assets covering 400 square miles? Um, this, I would say, specifically, if you want to reach out to me directly or, or our leasing department, we can help you with that. Um, this goes back to the idea of understanding exactly what you're looking to do, uh, potentially doing an RF analysis of how many sites it would take to cover that. Maybe it's the majority of American Tower sites. Maybe there's a couple sprinkled in of third parties as well to meet your coverage objectives, but we can help with that. Um, it's a very specific question. We have to actually scrub those individual assets to make sure the red centers are available and so forth. But that's exactly what we're here to do and assist our emerging customers with is that type of a scenario. Engage quickly. We can turn those things around pretty quickly and give you a, a full analysis of what it would look like to build that type of a coverage area. So look forward to uh, in, uh, interacting with you on that one. Um, the next one is, uh, we're, we're going all American Tower here. Uh, how's American Tower involved in working with smart city infrastructure? Um, I don't know, you want me to just take that one or you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I, I could touch on it just a little bit. I mean, um, you know, I think that you've seen in the in the news that American Tower is, is constantly looking for ways to, to innovate the, the infrastructure business. Uh, you know, just recently we, we signed a deal with Philips uh, with, a, with another large, always looking for ways to try to help out the smart cities and look for ways that uh, that we can use our experience and, and our knowledge to help these cities uh, grow. Yeah. I think that's, uh, to expand on your point, is I think we're always looking for new opportunities to assist the carriers, right? It's, it's uh, shared network infrastructure, and whether that's in buildings and small cells and macro sites, 
the appetite uh, of the end user is growing and growing and growing. And um, the, the young, I'll say it myself, the younger generations are using the phones much differently than we are, right? Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it's a Joyce different Adams. environment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, which makes it fun because it's, it's all the innovation that's coming out, right? The things that we can do, I mean, I, uh, not to be too nostalgic, but I remember when the first time I could read a, uh, a voicemail indicator, right? Now on my cell phone, I'm like, yeah, actually, no, I have a voicemail, right? And to see where we've come today with these, uh, pieces of equipment and these networks is, is fantastic to watch. Um, and with that, um, I want to share a tremendous thank you to Alan and Michael for joining us today uh, and to my colleague Steve. Um, a special thanks to our audience for your great questions. If we're unable to get to your questions today, we'll follow up with you shortly. Um, a recording of today's presentation will be made available to you. Uh, we strive to make these events beneficial and meaningful to our participants. Um, I think that's what you're seeing, that we're trying to be more educational uh, with these presentations. So uh, you'll receive a follow-up email in the coming days with a, a link to our post-event survey. Please take a few minutes to respond uh, as your answers will help guide us to our, our next events and future programs. So on behalf of American Tower and our panelists, thank you for joining today's webinar.